So um, what I'm going to try and convince you of this evening is why people with trichotillomania, and I pronounce it differently than you, Ian, I say trichotillomania, um, so we'll have to agree to disagree about that, I think, um, but why I think we need trichologists or tri trichologists, um, because we need somebody to help us with this problem, and I think you guys probably have more expertise than most. So I'm going to start by telling you the six things that I wish everybody knew about trichotillomania, hair pulling disorder. The first is that it is a type of disorder called a body focused repetitive behavior. So um, body focused repetitive behaviors, you'll hear me using the term BFRBs from time to time. It's all of the terminology in this area is a mouthful. I'm sorry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll generally use hair pulling disorder actually just because it's easier to say and easier to understand. But body focus repetitive behaviors include hair pulling, skin picking, nail biting. And the, the first thing that I want everybody to know is that they exist because most people don't know they exist, even though most people will know somebody who has one of these disorders. Um, most people have not ever heard of them. So you're already doing well. You already know that they exist. The second thing that I want everybody to know is that the urges that we suffer from are uncontrollable. So we cannot be told to stop. <laughs> Telling somebody with trichotillomania to stop pulling out their hair is just to add to the shame that they already feel. The urges that we experience are uncontrollable. I'm going to talk much more about that. But the important thing is that you know that they are uncontrollable urges that we suffer. The third thing is that they're really quite common. So the there aren't good epidemiological studies about this. But the, the, best, the best information that we have is probably around about 2% of people suffer from uncontrollable urges to pull out their hair. And if you sort of um, uh, scale that into the UK population, that might be as many as a million, or slightly more than a million people in the UK might suffer from um, uncontrollable urges to pull out their hair. The fourth thing is that it's really, really distressing. So this sort of harks back to the first point that I made. You guys know what it's like to live for your for your clients for your patients um you know that how much distress that they live with and then you need to add on top of that the sense that you're doing this to yourself and so you understand that living with these disorders really causes people very high levels of distress the fifth thing is to try to bust a myth about these disorders being a symptom of something else so you can't really see the details of this graph i'm going to show it a bit bigger later but the key thing that you need to know is that the uncontrollable urge to pull out your hair is not a symptom of anxiety. It's not a symptom of OCD. It's not a type of um, self-harm. It's a distinct, separate thing. It is true that lots of people have comorbidities. All psychiatric disorders are, are like that. There are, there are always lots of comorbidities. But there are also people who have no other comorbidities and only have uncontrollable urges to pull out their hair. Um, and so we need to be thinking of this as a distinct entity rather than mushing it in with other things. And then the last thing um, is about shame and stigma. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about shame and stigma um, over the course of the, the evening. Um, but it's it, um, the amount of stigma that surround these disorders makes living with them just full of shame. And so most people who have these disorders never tell anybody. They never seek treatment. They never feel able to talk about it openly because they feel so much shame about having these disorders. So I'm going to start by just telling you a bit about myself. So Ian's, Ian sort of rattled off my impressive sounding um, CV, but my story is, is, is one that's been um, sort of dogged through my life by trichotillomania. And as uh, Ian said, it's, it's still less than 12 months ago that I decided that maybe I could do something useful by being open about the disorder that I have struggled with. These these photos of me as a as a little one I chose because you can see uh, if you look closely. I, I think you'd probably have to look really quite closely. But you can see my eyelashes. So for me, my biggest the biggest problem of my hair pulling has always been my eyelashes. So I I have uncontrollable urges to pull up my eyelashes, my eyebrows. And I used to pull from a spot on the crown of my head, but somewhere along the line that sort of faded for me. But I still have problems with my eyelashes and eyebrows. And these photos represent before for me. And uh, my story um, has in it some trauma. So I, I associate the beginning of my hair pulling 
uh, with a period in my life when, un unfortunately, as I moved to secondary school, I was victim of um, being quite badly bullied. So I was completely socially isolated for a while. And that's coincident with when my hair pulling started. And I think it's relevant, but it's also important to say that not everybody with these disorders has a trauma story associated with the onset. And living with these disorder means living with something that's hidden in plain sight. So people with trichotillomania are masters of disguise. We will do anything to stop you knowing that we have missing hair. Um, so I have hardly any photos of me where you can see in where you can obviously see my missing hair. The photo on the left, you have to kind of look closely, but if you look closely, you can see I've got no eyelashes and no eyebrows, but I'm obviously wearing makeup. And the photo on the right is a photo is a before and after photo that I took when I had my eyebrows microbladed again just 12 months ago. Um, and so most people in the world know me looking like I do in the in the bottom photo there, made up. You'd never know, people don't notice. Um, but I know that how I really look is the photo on the top, and that's been very difficult to live with throughout my life. So I had some good therapy. I'm struggling to get the to move on. I had some good therapy along the way. And the most important thing that it did is help me to lose my sense of shame around these disorders. But my therapist encouraged me to, to, to create a picture in my mind of how does it feel when you're stuck in, the, in a, an episode of urges? Um, and the way that I described it to her was to say, you know, those um, mechanical claws that you see in scrapyards, they're like huge, big, powerful things that come down and, and pick up scrap and move it around in a scrapyard. And the, the, the picture that you can see here is my attempt to paint it. So in the corner there, you can see this mechanical claw that's lurking in the background. And when when I'm when I'm not experiencing urges, then I live in the sunshine and with the, the nice view uh, out on the right of this picture. But I know that that mechanical claw is sitting there in the background and it can reach out and grab me whenever it wants to. And when it grabs me, I'm stuck in it and I'm stuck in it until it lets me go. So there's a, there's an incredibly this is a another painting this time from inside the mechanical claw. So inside the mechanical claw, during the period of feeling completely powerless against the urges. I know that the real world is out there, but I can't I'm completely powerless. It's much more powerful than me. I can't break out of it until it lets me go. And another way to think about this is is that you kind of go into a bit of a trance. And this is this is something that I've become really interested in from a side of psychological perspective. What is this trance? In this trance, you don't you don't you're not aware. You can't use the information that you absolutely know, which is that you don't want to be pulling out your hair. I have never wanted to be pulling out my hair, but when I'm in this trance, I can't help it. So. I've already um, uh, talked about this a little bit, but one of the things that's difficult about living with a disorder like this is that you have to hold the contradictions. So on the one hand, the world tells you it's not that big a deal. No one can really tell. It's only hair. No one's interested. Most doctors, psychologists, etc., have never heard of this disorder. There's virtually no research. And you get told things like no one will fund this research. But on the other hand, you're also told by society that it is a really big deal because what will people think if they know that you are actively dis pulling out your own hair? You can't let anybody see, so you have to live in, in a sense of hiding yourself. And as you all know, our hair and our skin and our nails as human beings are kind of our peacock feathers. So if they're not there or they're not there to the extent that they should be or they're damaged in some way, we really at our core feel like not good enough human beings. You get distress expressed and caused by your your family, the people who who love you the most, because the only tools that they have available to you to them is to tell you to stop. But you can't stop. And so you feel like a failure in their eyes as well. And the most important reason why this is a big deal and we should give it some attention is because the personal distress that's felt with these by by people with these disorders is real. It's deep and it's chronic. And so when you live with the contradiction, as, as I have for all of my life, um, on the one hand, you have the sense that you are a failure. So in my head, until I had this ther the therapy recently, I've always had the mantra that I'm weak and I'm stupid and I'm ugly because I cannot control the urges to pull out my hair. But I also am this, you know, impressive looking uh, professor, Oxford University professor. And so you kind of 
you kind of hide behind the mask of, uh, of, of the picture on the right, even though inside you're feeling like the person on the left. And I am here today to tell you a bit about myself, but I also want you to know a bit about my community, the community of people with trichotillomania. Um, I have met a lot of people with this disorder, largely through um, internet support groups. And uh, a week or so ago, in anticipation of this talk, I reached out to, to one of the Facebooks that I'm active in and asked people if they would mind sharing with me photos of their trichotillomania so that I could show you the the extent uh, show you a bit about what this disorder looks like across different people and these are some photos that my my um my brave um uh colleagues my my brave co uh, collaborators sent me um and so i wanted to show you this picture to show to to really make this point about the but about there's something the same here obviously because all of these people suffer from uncontrollable urges to pull out their hair but as you can see, there are different patterns. There are different ways that people go about it. And um, you can see that for some people, it's really quite a small patch. When I used to pull from the crown of my head, it was a bit like the picture that's kind of middle right here. So my patch would have looked a lot like that, really quite a localized patch. You can see that some people kind of go for the hairline. Um, you can see that some people kind of go for a wider area uh, that's more distributed, so not so focal, not such a clear, um, bald patch, but uh, a thinning all over. And you can see that for some people, so the, the the lady in the bottom right here, almost all of her hair is gone because she has pulled it out. And um, you can also hopefully see some of these people are young, some of them are old, some of them are male, some of them are female. So there's a lot of differences in the phenomenon phenomenology of the disorder, but all of these people suffer from uncontrollable urges to pull out their hair. And the point I wanted to maybe interest you in is that between individuals, there's a huge variability in the patterns of hair loss that you see as a consequence of this disorder. But within individuals, it's actually highly stereotyped. So for me, for example, the bit of my head that I always wanted to pull from was right here, the, the, the top of the crown of my head, just like the lady on the, on the middle right here. And I've never had the slightest inclination to pull out hair from for example, around the back and the sides, that would hurt. I wouldn't want to do that. I have no desire whatsoever to pull from this area of my hair. And yet this bit of my hair, I cannot keep my hands away from. And obviously for me also, the eyelashes and the eyebrows have been a major challenge for years and years. And so the biggest problem that we face really is stigma. And um, in the medical profession, these are these are real quotes that I've heard from people. So in the medical profession, people say they've never heard of it. It's not really a proper condition. Never seen a patient, so it doesn't really count. Amongst the hair and beauty position um, uh, profession, I've heard never heard of it. It's not a hair problem. You just have to stop pulling at your hair. And amongst the research communities, I hear I've never heard of it. Isn't it just a symptom of X, Y, or Z? And you're never going to get funding for this. And across all of these groups of individuals, the the, the message you hear the loudest is why don't you just stop? And unfortunately, this is also the message that you hear from your family, no matter how loving they might be, and they're acting from the best of intentions, everybody is saying, why don't you just stop? And so as the person who suffers from this disorder, there's only one question you can ask yourself, which is, why can't I just stop? And in my community of people that I um, am connected with online, and again, there's about this. This I'm, I'm um, sampling from probably twenty thousand people across a number of different support groups um, that are internationally uh, um, uh, around the world. And the most common questions that you see in these groups are: Why can't I stop? What can help me to stop? How can I help my child to stop? And just why am I doing this? Why do? Why can I not stop? You know, why am I so stupid? Why am I so? crazy? Why am I so weird? Why can't I stop doing this? I hate myself. I'm disgusted with myself, etc. So there's a huge amount of distress and a huge need for somebody to come along and have some ideas about, about the answers to these questions. But the, the second most common kind of category of questions is really where you guys come in, I think. And that's around lots of anxiety about whether hair will grow back. You know, how much do I have to pull it before my hair will just give up the ghost and stop growing? Um, personally, I know that my hair has grown back in some places and not so well in other places. Don't know why some places grow better than others. For example, my eyelashes still grow, bless them. They still do their best to grow up, grow through, whereas my eyebrows have given up long ago. 
Um, and, and how can I encourage regrowth? So obviously the, the, the most obvious thing is you need to keep your hands away from your hair. But that if I'm able to keep my hands away from my hair, what other things can I do to encourage regrowth? So these are really, really commonly asked questions and there are never good answers to these questions. So I've already um, uh, given you some of the information that's on this infographic. It's common, it causes a lot of distress. The comorbidities are common, but this is not a symptom of other disorders. But let me just tell you another few um, facts about trichotillomania. So first of all, the most common age of onset is around adolescence. That's the way it was for me. I was about 12 years old when mine started. Most people never seek treatment. And of those who do, most don't find any help uh, or, or even any sympathy amongst those they ask for help. Um, in psychiatry, we talk about functional impairment as a, as a sort of a way of measuring how much impact something has on people's lives. That means how much... How much of your life are you not living because of your disorder? So people with these disorders have moderate levels of functional impairment, meaning they uh, they feel like they can't go swimming, they feel um, embarrassed to go out socially. They'll they'll um, you know, some people find themselves kind of stuck in the trance, such that they can't get themselves off the sofa to get to work in the morning. So there's a lot of various different ways of there being real kind of functional impairment for people. There's a myth that the disorder is more common in women. Um, more women talk about the disorder. If you, in, in most of the treatment studies and the sort of epidemiology studies, the surveys that are done, there is a huge predominance of females. So it's four to one female to male. But the only um, population studies that have been done, and they're, they're not great, but they're the best we've got, suggest that actually it's much more equal. So and I, I suspect that what that means is that men are affected as much as women. Men can probably more easily hide by shaving heads or, you know, or shaving beards, whatever it might be, and maybe therefore suffer from a little bit less distress, less feel less able to come forwards. But I think that this is just as common in men as it is in women. And then the other thing uh, on this infographic is that the triggers vary. So... Um, when I, uh, after I was kind of able to take off my cloak of shame and really kind of start to get curious about my trichotillomania, I noticed that I have, I think, three different types of triggers. So there are three different things that cause me to be more likely to suffer from urges. So sometimes it's emotional. So sometimes it's because I'm ruminating about something or I'm fretting about something or I've had a particularly exciting day and I, I'm kind of full of adrenaline or whatever it might be. So sometimes I can identify an emotional trigger. I can usually actually overcome those these days, but the ones that I find really difficult to overcome are the sensory ones. So sometimes, this happened to me only yesterday, sometimes it feels like the follicles are shouting to me. It feels like there's something about this patch of skin. Maybe it's, I don't know, just some just one of those little blemishes that we get from time to time. But there's something about this patch of skin which is causing sensitivity. And to my brain, that's a, that that message is pull out the hair. You need to pull out the hair. You need to pull out the hair. And, and try as I might, when I suffer from one of those urges, I find it incredibly difficult not to. And, and, and the problem is I tell myself over and over and over again not to do it. But my hand goes up anyway. I'm, I don't make a decision to pull up my hair. I find my hand up there pulling at my hair because the sensory trigger is so loud to me to my brain and that sort of speaks to the third type as well which is that a lot of people with this disorder report that they find themselves pulling out their hair they don't make a decision to pull out hair they are actually unaware or in a trance-like state when pulling and so it's it, it's very difficult to then put in place something to help people make an alternative decision because they never made a decision to pull in the first place and some people even report finding themselves pulling in their sleep so um, uh, I've been busy in this last year, starting to raise awareness and reduce stigma around this topic. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist, and so I thought that I would have a go at trying to uh, um, create a perspective that comes from my knowledge of neuroscience and my lived experience of what it's like to live with this disorder. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm obviously not meant to be able to read all those words, but I'll just try and summarize this paper in in terms of the three main points that I try to make, and, and some of them you've already heard. So the first is that comorbidities really complicate the presentation. So as I've said, it's actually quite common that people with trichotillomania also have anxiety. 
Now, the assumption often is that anxiety causes the pulling. I actually think it's probably just as likely that having an uncontrollable be behavior like hair pulling causes people to live with a lot of anxiety. And I know I have personal, um, uh, 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 not personal experience, but I have um, I have spoken to people who say they the hair pulling came first, the anxiety came second for them. So I think it's really it's really it's really messy when you look, when you try to look at the literature on trichotillomania. It's really it's really kind of muddied by the comorbidities, and so th there's more we need to do to disentangle these things. And importantly, at least twenty percent of trichotillomania is pure, so there's no other comorbidities in town. We need to be thinking of these disorders as distinct from other things. And then uh, an aspect of that that I really like to draw people's attention to is that these that the actual behaviour is motor. Of course, it's a movement that we're doing, and the motor systems of our brains are are kind of specifically designed to learn patterns of movements, to encode them, and then to execute them without going via the decision-making parts of your brain. That's how we learn to walk and ride bikes and play tennis and all of the other things that we do. So the motor, the fact that this is a motor symptom, a motor, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pattern of motor movements, is I think a really important aspect of this and that it, you, that's why I think we find ourselves doing it without having made a conscious decision to do it. The second really important point, and in some ways this is the most important of all, is that picking, pulling, biting behaviours are normal. Actually, everybody picks and pulls and bites at themselves. It's part of our normal grooming behaviour. And it's not just human beings that do it, all primates do it. And actually many animals pick and pull and bite at themselves and these these behaviors um, uh, are for uh, serve different purposes, but fundamentally, a bit of picking and pulling and biting at ourselves is normal human behavior. And so, the thing that's abnormal in people who live with the disorder is not that we start; it's that we can't stop. So, again, I think it's uh, it's really important that people understand that. And moreover, when primates are put into a position uh, into a situation where they're very highly distressed, and that might be by being put in captivity or indeed finding themselves at the bottom of the pecking order and bottom of the social the social hierarchy, they pull out their own hair. And so it's not just human beings that do this. This is not some invention of modern humans. There's something kind of hardwired in there, which is for who knows why, but the desire to kind of pick and pull at yourself is associated with distress in nature, in biology. And then the third thing I've already talked about shame a little bit, but the specific thing that I think is important to know about shame is that I think is shame is actually a, an important maintainer of the distress that causes the urge to pick, pull, and bite. I'll say a bit more about that in a in a in a in a moment. But the um, the thing is that shame isn't just a consequence. I think it keeps us in the trap. I think it keeps us trapped in a world where we're always experiencing a level of distress, and therefore we always need to self soothe. And the picking, pulling, biting, for some reason, for some of us, is a self-soothing behaviour. Stigma, and I'm going to talk more about the, uh, what, what exactly I mean by shame and stigma in a moment, but stigma amplifies shame. And so the most important thing that I, I think that I can do in the, in the short term is talk openly about this disorder so that people understand more about it. We reduce stigma. We allow people to live with a little bit less shame. They'll come out of hiding, and then we can do the research that needs doing. So this is kind of how I think about it uh, at the moment. So let's just say something causes the brain to be in some kind of distress. So that might be a psychological disorder. It might be some trauma. It might be living with neurodevelopmental differences. So these dis these behaviors are more common in people with autistic spectrum disorder, more common in ADHD. Something causes the brain to be in some sort of distress. Once the brain's in distress, for those individuals, this sets up the cycle. So distress leads to an urge. The urge is to pick, pull or bite. And then if you follow through and pick, pull or bite, you get some sort of very, very brief feeling of relief. <coughs> Excuse me. But unfortunately, that's followed pretty immediately by a wave of shame and shame keeps you in distress. And so you go around and around. Now, what I'm getting more interested in is other ways that you might find your way into this circle via sensory input. So is there something, I'm going to come to this again in a minute, is there something about that skin? Is there something about the way that the immune system is interacting with the kind of skin brain um, uh, 
uh, uh, skin brain interactions that's causing an urge that we just don't really understand yet. I've already talked about how if you uh, if you practice a motor pattern for a while, it becomes a habit. And uh, in this case, I don't mean a habit like it's a bad habit and you can just stop it. I mean habit in the neuro neuroscientific term, which is an overlearned pattern of motor uh, uh, of movements that you execute without checking in on the decision making um, part of your brain. And then there's another thing which is about homeostasis, which is that almost everything that our bodies, our bodies are designed to keep us homeostatically even. There's all sorts of systems in the body that make sure that you stay the same temperature, that you uh, that you have enough water in you. You know, we've, uh, all of the things that we've evolved over millennia, not just uh, not just as human beings, but as as organisms, we've evolved in order to be able to keep a steady state inside. And is there something about that that's somehow not quite right for people with this disorder? So I think there might be some kind of shortcut here between the neurodiversity and the sensory issues. As you may know, people with, uh, who have um, neurode neurodevelopmental um, disorders also often have sensory processing disorders. So there might be some interesting uh, extra little uh, connection there. And then this um, middle arrow is the trance that I talked about. So when, once you get stuck in your cycle, this sort of dissociation that you experience, I think might keep you in just the bottom half of this equation. So all you're doing is urge, pull, relief, urge, pull, relief until, you know, somehow you're, 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 you're set free from that. Shame, I'm, uh, shame is the biggie, as I've already said, and shame is amplified by stigma. So let me just spend a couple of slides explaining what I mean by shame and stigma, because um, uh, there, there are words that we kind of all know, but they're very easily um, dismissed as, as being kind of trivial. But I think they're super important. So there, uh, shame and stigma are described as social emotions. We only have shame and stigma because we are social animals. We're social animals for lots of good reasons. There are lots of evolutionary advantages of going around in a pack. You you're, you're, you have better chance of um, uh, being more efficient in the way that you might forage or hunt. You better defense from predators, etc. Lots of good reasons why we're social animals. But uh, like all advantages, there's always a bit of a trade off. And so living as a, a, a social animal has some trade offs in terms of risk of disease, etc. But probably the one that's most important to us here is this uh, the, is the element of stress that comes from having to create and maintain bonds uh, within a social context, which is where shame and stigma come from. So sh just to, just to sort of make sure that we're all on the same page with the labels, stigma is the feeling that someone else doesn't belong, the feeling that somebody, somebody is out of the group for whatever reason. The group is one way, that individual is another way. That's what stigma is. And so you'll all know, because people people with um, hair loss for all sorts of reasons will experience stigma. Hair loss is a highly, highly stigmatized area of biology or, or psychology or whatever we want to call it. Um, yeah, As professionals, you probably experience stigma because people don't think hair is as important as everybody should realize that it is. And then shame is what the individual feels as a consequence of living in a, in a stigmatized environment. Shame is, is the individual saying to themselves, I'm not good enough because of X, Y, and Z. And we all know that feeling. We all, uh, that, that feeling is, is useful to us in various ways. It's, it's how we check that we're not doing or saying anything that's going to cause us to be sent out of, the, of our group. Um, but we know that when you live with a lot of shame, it ends up really dominating a lot of your life. Um, and so that's what we really want to try to, we need to reduce the stigma so that we can al allow people to live with less shame with these disorders. So why are these disorders so stigmatized? So there are lots of reasons that you guys all will understand well, which is that hair isn't given the status that we know that it should have. Um, but even within hair disorders, these disorders are stigmatized. And I think the biggest reason is this fella and it's the prefrontal cortex. I'm not gonna give you a huge neuroscience lecture, but I will just tell you a bit about the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is the latest bit of the brain to be to have evolved. Human beings have a much bigger prefrontal cortex than any other animal. It's our, uh, it's our control center. It's our executive controller. 
it, um, it allows us to do all sorts of amazing things. It is the reason that human beings can do amazing things. We wouldn't want to be without our prefrontal cortex. But our prefrontal cortex is also arrogant. Our prefrontal cortex thinks that it rules the roost. It thinks that the only reason we do anything is because the prefrontal cortex says so. And so I think I think that the prefrontal cortex causes what I like to call the fundamental attribution error. Sorry, this ridiculously long words. I can't help myself. But what I mean by that is we get the we get the blame wrong. So the fundamental attribution error is that a person with trichotillomania is making a deliberate conscious decision to pull out their own hair and therefore could stop if they chose to. So the reason why that's so wrong and why we need to we need to just ask the prefrontal cortex to back off is because behavior is way more complicated than that. So now I am just going to do one slide of kind of neuroscience 101. And this is this is about how we end up pulling out uh, how we end up doing any behavior. But let, we're, we're talking about pulling hair out. So here is a here is a timeline. Oops, a timeline um, at the end of which a hair is pulled out. In the milliseconds before that, neurotransmitters crossed synapses, caused um, neurons to fire, and caused a hand to move to a head and pull out a hair. The most likely thing that causes that is some sort of sensory input. Something in the brain gave that the the um, the movement bit of the brain the message: right, go now, go do the thing. Um, so there's there's all sorts of stuff involved in this, there's, uh, and I'm going to come back to those sensory inputs in a bit. That the 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 thing that I'm most excited about in terms of talking to you guys is I really think the skin's got some. Uh, is it, we need to be we need to be thinking more about the skin's role in all of this. I'll come back to that in a bit. In the seconds before that, hormones are kind of uh, doing their thing. So again, hormones are really about homeostasis. We're trying to make sure that the body is safe and warm and dry and fed and watered and all of those things. But the hormones have got all sorts of in interesting ways of regulating our behavior that we actually don't have a huge amount of control of. In the minutes to hours before that, then you've got to be starting to think about the context. So what was the immediate context? Were there any stressors? What was the recent context? Was there, What was the recent social context? Was there something that happened in that context that made the behavior more likely to happen? So that, that bit there is really the realm of where psychologists tend to focus their effort. In the months before that, or the years before that, you've learned some motor patterns and you're kind of stuck with these learned patterns. You're actually not like, we never forget how to ride a bike. We're never going to forget those movements, and so we might learn to we might learn to inhibit them in some way, but they're stuck with us now because they are overlearned motor patterns. There might well be some early life context, or so even your fetal environment will have will have effects on all of the systems that are upstream of it. And so, there, and again, this is the realm of psychologists who might have something to say about uh, what what happened early in life that might have made your homeostatic patterns or your particular patterns of neurotransmitters and synapses more susceptible to the urges to pick and pull. We've also got the genetics. So from birth, from conception, you had a particular package of genes. These disorders run in families. We know there's, her there's inheritance going on here. And so there's, there's definitely some degree of genetic component. And now we might be, now you might feel like we're, we're getting ridiculous, but as I've already told you, Humans are not the only species to exhibit these behaviors. And so actually we the uh, how humans have evolved probably does have an important, uh, there's probably important lessons there in terms of how all of these other things work. And then, you know, I'm, I, I go all the way back to the primordial soup, which might feel a bit ridiculous as I've already said, but as I've also already said, we know that um, uh, other primates pick and pull and bite. And we also know that picking, pulling, biting in primates serves multiple purposes it's not just picking out parasites so you know you think of uh, uh, you think of um kind of uh, uh, uh monkeys or or uh, uh, primates or whatever as you can see in the picture here kind of picking at each other in order to clean each other it's there's a hygiene thing there's a kind of a it's actually an, a motor immune response so these guys will very very in a very focused way will will pick at each other if you look at the focus that they have that primates have when they're doing grooming behavior, that's exactly how it feels when you're stuck in one of those trances, completely focused on the picking and pulling and biting behavior. 
But also, of course, we know that picking, pulling, uh, picking, uh, grooming in in primates is uh, intrinsically linked to social uh, to to your society, to your social group. So the grooming, who grooms who, is is a sort of um, uh, is a, is a way of thinking about social dominance hierarchies. And so you know, you groom the person you want to groom with the person who's a bit higher up the social. A dominant hierarchy they want to groom with the person who's a bit higher up so there's a lot of kind of social stuff going on in here which uh, needs to be borne in mind as well so this particular study which i really like because i really like the concept of this being kind of scratching an itch um, and this study indicates that the animals scratch primarily because of an immunostimulus itch possibly triggered by parasites but it also confirms that self-grooming acts as a displacement activity in the state in the case of social uncertainty and I refer you back to mine being my, my my personal journey starting with massive social uncertainty because it was when I was being bullied at school. There's very interesting, you know, all sorts of interesting things there. And if you're interested in in the stuff that I've talked about in the last few slides, I highly recommend this book by a, a brilliant neuroscientist called Robert Spolsky called Behave. Um, much of the the slide, particularly the slide with the timeline on it, was inspired by this book and. I picked out this quote that I like, which is that in the moments just before we decide upon some of our most consequential, act consequential actions, we are less rational and less autonomous in our decision making than we like to think. OK, so just a just a few slides um, now on the skin mind connection, the skin mind interaction. Now, this is not an area I know a lot about, and and but it is an area I think is absolutely fascinating. So I feel myself drawn into this area. And when you, I mean, I as a neuroscientist, when I first was, um, in fact, it was Jill Westgate who might be, who's one of you guys, one of your gang, who first um, drew my attention to the to the term psychodermatology and this connection between the skin and the mind, and uh, and it was it was an absolute eye opener. And yet we all know that there's an intimate connection between our skin, our hair and our skin and our minds and our emotions. So I find it kind of incredible that this isn't something that we know more about, really, because we know that our hair stands on end when we're scared. We blush when we're embarrassed. We sweat when we're anxious. We get goosebumps when we're excited. We know that emotions have direct and uncontrollable consequence or, or, or um, uh, expressions in our skin and our hair. So how come it's a mystery to us how how those things were? I mean, maybe it's less of a mystery to you, but to me, it still feels like a mystery. And um, uh, I put the, the little uh, image on the right here to remind me to say that the human brain has has kind of two distinct when we when we learn about neuroscience we we learn about the brain as having two distinct systems the first is the central nervous system that's very much got this guy the prefrontal cortex at the top of the tree it's the kind of i'm making the conscious decisions around here and i know i'm in charge and then but most of our nervous system is actually the automatic autonomic stuff it's called autonomic the autonomic nervous system that does all of the keeping us alive stuff that we have no conscious control over, and so again, I'm I'm really intrigued by this, the, by the um, by the juncture where where conscious control and and automatic stuff sit, and particularly in this realm of the hair and skin connection, which uh, uh, the hair and mind connection, which I uh, I would love to, you know, if any of you know more about this or be interested in exploring it with me, I'd be delighted to uh, get excited with you. Uh, I stuck this slide on um, again. I feel uh, I feel I feel a bit um, uh, out of my depth, uh, but but I really I, I put this slide together just because I wanted to make the point, and I'm directly quoting Jill Westgate here, who she she told me that the innovation, in other words, the nervous system that surrounds the hair, is incredibly complicated, and actually there are lots of different types of fibers doing lots of different types of things that have all sorts of ways of connecting to the higher higher order centers in our brains, and I find that again, I just find that absolutely fascinating. And in neuroscience, this is not something that people are thinking about. So I think there's a real kind of opportunity to maybe put our minds together to to learn a bit more about this. And again, I'd love to chat with anybody who'd, who's got interesting ideas. And Jill also um, introduced me to the term psychodermatology. And again, it's sort of a, 
duh moment because of course we know that there are intimate interactions between skin and hair and and mind and there are lots of disorders there are lots of dermatological disorders that have psychological consequences depression anxiety all, all of the usual suspects there are also psychiatric uh, disorders that have dermatological consequences so again i think this is this is an area that's underserved under 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 appreciated uh, and ripe for uh, a bit more uh, investigation uh, I'm not going to go through this slide in a great deal of detail, but this slide is just uh, to make the point that it's a, this is a, this is a beginning of a journey for me, and there's an awful lot to do. So there's still a lot we don't know about the phenomenology of BFRBs. I've told you some of the things that I know from my own experience, but the good good quality research in most of these areas still hasn't been done. People don't ask. People uh, in standard psychiatric psychological assessments. The, the question, do you suffer from uncontrollable urges to pick, pull up, pick at your skin, pull out your hair, etc., doesn't get asked. And so one of my missions is to get that question asked so that we get better epidemiological data. There's obviously the whole world of treatments. Um, psychological treatments have some efficacy, but actually I think they don't work. They tend to not work for long. So they're, they're, they they may be successful in the short term, but people tend to relapse. So people who have these disorders tend to tend to have the sense that they're going to have it forever and that, that and there's nothing that can help them. Who knows whether there might be pharmacological interventions? I feel kind of slightly odd about that. I'm not so sure that taking a pill for this, but who knows? Who knows? Uh, who knows where it'll take us? <coughs> Excuse me. We still need to develop good measures. There are some measures. I don't think they're great. I'm not sure they're great. I'm not sure they're very valid, but. Uh, there's some work to do there. And then there's the whole world of the mechanisms. And uh, again, I won't go through this in great detail, but you can see that I've already uncovered all sorts of areas of science to where I think there's interesting things to do. And the the thing, the one to draw attention to is that is that um, uh, is that one on the far left there, which is the hair and skin science. So, uh, and um, again, I'm just I'm here to try and get you interested in in learning more about it. So and and this is my this is my last sort of um, majorly data heavy slides, but um, a word heavy slide. But this is this is why I, I, this slide I'm going to try to convince you the BFRBs are an interesting and complicated problem. So to understand BFRBs, you have to understand all of the aspects of the phenomenology, and so that is the urges are episodic. We don't we don't suffer from them all the time. They come and go. They don't ha they don't seem to have a particularly obvious rhyme or reason to when they come and go. So there's something that so I live most of my life without any urges, but when the urges come, the urges come. People with these disorders can pick and pull and bite anywhere on their bodies, but within an individual, usually the um, the target area is highly stereotyped. So why that bit of hair and not that bit of hair? Importantly, we don't really feel pain. It's not true that it, you do ha you do have a sensation, but if I pull hair from here, it's a different feeling than if I try than if I pulled hair from what, from an area that I that is not my not my target zone. If I pull from my not target zone, it would hurt. It would hurt like it would hurt anybody else. When I pull hair from the target zone, it's a feeling, but it's not pain. So it's something something interesting there. I've already told you that the triggers aren't all the same and you can just as easily be triggered by boredom as you can by stress. The episodes aren't all the same. Sometimes you find yourself in that very kind of trance-like focused state. Sometimes you're not thinking about it at all and you just find yourself doing it. So the episodes aren't all the same. I already talked about the trance. And then uh, the consequences, of course, are the distress, the functional impairment and the shame. If I just tune into this sensory, the sensory bit here, and I, and, I, and this is some questions that I think um, might be interesting to explore. So is there something physiologically different about the skin or the hair, the, you know, the skin or the follicles, I suppose, in those sites where we pull from? Is there, is there something, was, was, was there always something that was different about those areas? Is there something we can learn about the skin mind connection from other disorders? You know, you, uh, you guys will treat people with similar kinds of disorders. <coughs> Excuse me, and my cough gets me every now and again. Is there is there something that we can learn from those other disorders that are is important in terms of the trichotillomania story? Is there something that can be done, I wonder, to change how the skin feels in one of those kind of hot sensory urges 
I think I wonder, for example, would it would should I go around in my pocket with a tube full of um, you know, tattoo uh, analgesic, the the, the sort of painkiller that you put on if you're having tattoos? I've never tried it. I probably should. Would that actually sort me out? You know, if I, if I could numb it, would would I, would I be able to resist the urges? And and I, I, I maybe so, but nobody's done that. But that might be interesting. Um, and then, is there anything that can be done to promote hair regrowth after repeated mechanical pulling? Lots of people worry about that a lot. So I, I'm just coming to an end, um, but I wanted to finish uh, with uh, this this person. This is a young person. I don't know this person. I painted her, but I don't know her. Um, but she's really the focus of my attention. I She's living with a body-focused repetitive behaviour. She feels completely alone with it. She doesn't have anybody she can ask for help. The only help, the only support, if you in inverted commas, she gets is people telling her that she should stop. And there's some things that I really want you to know about her. There's six things that I want you to know about her. She suffers from a disorder and not a character flaw. She thinks she she probably thinks she's just weak and stupid and ugly, but she's got a disorder, and she deserves and that deserves our attention and respect. She, the urges that she experiences to pull out her hair are uncontrollable. She really, really wants to not be pulling out her hair, but she cannot control those urges. She's not alone. There are plenty of other people like her. If, it, it, it would be great if we could connect her with the other people who are feeling the same way and so she doesn't feel so alone. Um, but it, importantly, there are lots of people like her uh, who need help with this. The hair pulling that she experiences causes her a lot of distress. She feels really terrible about the fact that she has to go around with bald patches, but she also feels terrible about the fact that it's her hands that are doing it. She she knows that she's doing it to herself and that makes her feel terrible. Her hair pulling is not part of another disorder. She hasn't got any other disorders. She just can't resist the urge to pull out her hair. And she experiences a huge amount of shame and, and she, she feels a huge amount of shame and that's amplified by the stigma that she experiences because there's not enough awareness around these disorders. So I would just like to finish by encouraging you to follow me. So you can find me at the Trick Prof on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, the the webpage there is where you can find links to the things that I've been writing, re, um, uh, some podcasts and things. You can email me if anybody's interested in more information or and peer support. You can find that by a BFRB UK and Ireland, or by the US based BFRB um, Trichotillomania Learning Centre. I'd like to thank my own hairdresser. So this is Susan Handy. She uh, she has a um, a salon in Henley on Thames, Mary Handy Hair and Beauty. And it was Susan who gave me Ian's name and said, I think you need to talk to Ian and he'll connect you to people. And so thanks to Susan for making that connection. And Susan and I are both uh, have both just contributed to the feature edition in, in Salon Focus, which is the magazine of the National Hair and Beauty Federation. The feature article is coming out in their next uh, edition, which is coming out in a few weeks time. And Susan very kindly um, told her side of the story of what it's like to be the hairdresser of somebody with a BFRB. And finally, uh, last but not least at all, um, we are organising the first Oxford BFRB conference um, uh, later this year. So please, if you're interested and uh, you might be interested in coming to Oxford, put the put September the 13th and 14th in your um, diaries. We haven't actually made the announcement yet, but I, um, I'm about to send out the save the date um, invite. This is gonna be a two day event. The first day will be all science. So we'll have speakers talking about all sorts of aspects of things that I've told you today. Um, and the second day is a community event. So that will be lots of people who have these disorders making connections. And uh, if anybody would like to know more, I'd love it if some of you might be interested in coming along. Uh, just drop me a line if you're interested in, in any of that. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing my slides.